Today we have a complete in-depth review of the new DJI Mini 3. Now all the footage that you see right now on the screen is coming direct out of the camera itself, so there's no editing or tweaking to that footage, it's straight out of the drone. Now in this review, I'm gonna cover everything that's new between the Mini 3 compared to the Mini 2, but I'm also gonna briefly touch on the differences between the Mini 3 and the Mini 3 Pro, because while they share the same name and there are some similarities, there's also a bunch of differences. But because there are so many differences there, I'm also gonna have a separate video up in the corner here in the next day or two that dives into all the nuanced differences all the little quirky things that the marketing site doesn't tell you. Also, apologize, my voice is a bit rough today, just kind of wrapping up a bit of a cold here. So with that, let's just dive straight into it. Now, there are three basic ways you can buy this drone. The first is just the drone itself. So if you have an existing controller, either the DJI RC or the RCN1 from uh, the last couple years, then you don't need to buy a controller and you can save some money. The next way is with this DJI RCN1. In that case, you've got this, you put your phone on the top of it in that little slot right there, and you're good to go. And the third way you can buy it is with the DJI RC. Now in this case, this RC is a fully self-contained controller. Uh, as you can see right there, you have the screen on it uh, and it can basically run the version of Android. It's relatively similar to the smart control or the DJI RC Pro of years past. As of right now, the Mini 3, the base unit, is not compatible with the RC Pro, uh, but the Mini 3 Pro is. I suspect that might change over time. Now, within those three categories of no controller, this controller, or that controller, you've also got the ability to get the Fly More Combo. Now, the Fly More Combo essentially comes with a couple extra batteries and this battery charging bank. This is arguably the best battery bank DJI has done ever. They've done a lot of banks, like every drone gets a ridiculous new battery style. This one is awesome. Uh, USB-C charging there. You also get a regular USB-A port so you can charge up the controller by just plugging it on the side of it. Uh, and then the three batteries just slide in and they lock. So you can throw this in a bag with a battery bank or whatever the case may be and kind of top them off as you go. Uh, now there is one battery in the drone itself and then you get two additional batteries. However, while I said there was a Fly More Combo, there's also Fly More Combo Plus in certain regions. Europe is not one of those regions. And in the Fly More Combo Kit Plus, you get the bigger batteries. Uh, so these bigger batteries are the same physical size, but they have much longer battery life. We'll talk about that in just a second. So with that, let's talk about what's new on the Mini 3 compared to the Mini 2. Uh, the first thing is a camera bump, uh, in a good way, by the way. Uh, so first off, the sensor size has, has increased from one over 2.3 inches to one over 1.3 inches, which I know sounds smaller, but it's actually bigger the way cameras work. And they've also gone from an f2.8 down to an f1.7. And that's a huge deal for low light performance in particular. Next, they've increased the quality from 4K to 4K HDR, though you don't have any of the options for things like the cine profile that you do on the Mini 3 Pro. And then from a frame rate standpoint, I've tossed those on the screen, more or less the same as the Mini 2. The main difference here between the Mini 3 and the Mini 3 Pro is there's no 60 frames per second in 4K like there is a Mini 3 Pro, and there's no 120 frames per second in 1080p like there is my Mini 3 Pro as well. Now while the internals of the camera have been upgraded, I think actually the bigger deal is the externals of the camera, in particular the new gimbal style. Uh, the gimbal in the camera setup is the same as on the Mini 3 Pro, and with that allows true vertical shooting. The entire camera lens will rotate 90 degrees and allows you to shoot natively in uh, that vertical format. That's notable because while you can certainly make a vertical crop out of a horizontal picture, the reality is that's just simply not the same. The other thing that this new gimbal allows you to do is to go upwards to 60 degrees versus previously is limited to 20 degrees. While I don't tend to use the ability to shoot all the way up to 60 degrees a lot, there are certainly some cool shots you can do with that, especially on like tall buildings or structures where maybe towering above you. The last thing to note is that the quick shots feature has been updated to allow vertical shooting. Uh, you can see that right here where I shot this uh, lighthouse in the quick shots mode doing an orbit around it. Uh, that's all natively done in the vertical shooting mode in quick shots. Okay, and a quick note, if you're finding this video interesting or useful, now is an awesome time to whack that like button. It really does help with this video and the channel quite a bit. Next, there's both a change in the batteries and an increase in battery life. With the base batteries, you go from 31 minutes up to 38 minutes. However, with the plus batteries in the regions that support that, you go up to 51 minutes, which is actually more than the Mini 3 Pro, just by like three minutes or so, likely because you're not powering those obstacle avoidance sensors on the Mini 3 Pro, which is a good thing to note, there is no obstacle avoidance sensors on the Mini 3 base. As a result of that, it doesn't have active track either. Still, active track components are actually built into the Quick Shots feature. See this right here, where I'm using one of the Quick Shot options to actively track me as I'm riding along. 
Now this is the same as a Mini 1 and the Mini 2, uh, and I've actually done full videos on how to create these exact same shot. I'll put one of them up in the corner there, and I'll probably reshoot it on the Mini 3 as well, but again, it's the exact same feature, just leveraging the quick shot functionality, and this is completely automated. What you're seeing right there, I am not touching the controller at all, it is simply doing its own thing. Now as I noted earlier on, the Plus battery, that's the one that does not have the weight printed on it right there, so you see Plus has no weight, the uh, regular battery has the weight printed on it, so that way when it's in the aircraft, it shows that it's a sub 250 gram aircraft, because that is a core thing with the entire DJI Mini series to keep it under 250 grams, which is really notable for certain regulatory bodies in terms of regulations and licenses and stuff like that. Which is why this battery is not actually offered in Europe. DJI says that by having this battery, it puts it over the weight limit, and it does. It puts it about 287 grams versus roughly 246 grams with a regular battery. Uh, still, that doesn't really make sense to me because obviously they sell plenty of other aircraft that are above that weight limit, uh, and they still sell those even though they require additional licensing in Europe. Nonetheless, if you travel to somewhere like the US, you can buy the plus size batteries and you can bring them back to Europe and fly them quite legally as long as you have the right license to do so. There's nothing in the aircraft stopping you from doing that. You know, it works just fine. I've done it myself just fine. So that is at least nice to know. Now next, one thing this does not have is those obstacle avoidance sensors like I mentioned. Uh, so if we look on the Mini 3 Pro, on the top right here, you have those two sensors that are forward facing. Those are also two sensors right there that are backwards facing so it doesn't run into trees or forward in trees. And even on the bottom, there are two additional sensors used for obstacle avoidance. This is in addition to the single set of downward facing sensors right there that the Mini 3 base has, and that's primarily just to keep it from hitting the ground when it lands. So they're simply ground proximity sensors. They're not actually obstacle avoidance sensors like you see on the Mini 3 Pro. Now, let's talk through a quick list of what has not changed. What's still in this drone? Because I think that's super important. Uh, number one, it still has a quick shot mode, as you can see right here. Quick shot modes are a set of series automated drone moves. Basically, they make it easy to get really complicated shots with a single tap of the button. In this case, I selected a boat, but it could be a person, a tree, a building, whatever it may be. And now it's going off and doing and grabbing this particular shot. This happens to be in orbit, a little more challenging given the wind and the boat speed, but it's slowly getting there. Uh, number two, obviously, it's still under 250 grams as long as you have the base battery. Number three, it still has a pretty high wind resistance level. Uh, 24 miles per hour, 38 kilometers per hour is the official spec. In reality, you can go above that. I've tested the Mini 3, the Mini 2, the Mini 1, the Spark, all these drones in higher winds than that. In fact, this very drone right here is about two days ago in 50 kilometer hour winds over water, zero problems at all in either control. And of course, the imagery from that look pretty stunning too. Also in the list, it still has all the same photo modes in the past. So it's got still shots at both JPEG as well as RAW. Uh, you can do timer mode, so basically every two seconds, five seconds, whatever the case may be. You can do auto exposure bracketing where it shoots a bunch of different photos at once in different brackets. And you can do panoramas, uh, both 360, 180, wide shots, and then it just simply stitches those all together after the fact. So with that, we'll just talk through a simple flight. Outside, you're gonna unfold the arms just like this to get it all expanded out, locks in place, and then you just press this button here once, and then long hold to go ahead and turn it on. The same is true for the remote control. You'll press it once there and then long hold to turn it on. In all the flights I did, it took generally between 25 and like 40 seconds or so uh, for it to find GPS, which is about where I want it to be pretty quick and easy. It uses GPS both in the air as well as to set a home point in case the drone loses connectivity. It'll know where to fly back to and automatically land. And when it does the automatic landing, again, it uses those sensors on the bottom, those two right there, to go ahead and basically ensure it doesn't like plummet into the ground and cause any damage. Now, taking off is pretty easy. You can either press the button on the side right there to go ahead and take off, or you can bring the sticks in like this, and that'll go ahead and start the props as you see right there. There we go, stop that before I hurt myself. Anyways, with it up in the air, you're gonna start flying around. Now on the right-hand side of the screen, you've got basically a panel for controlling different photo and video modes. There's essentially two kind of categories of stuff, video stuff and photo stuff. Uh, so in the video stuff, for example, in the lower right-hand corner, you can change the resolution, and that's noble because by default, it probably is not gonna be the highest settings. So you can tap that, for example, and change the resolution as well as the frame rate. Uh, now that's notable, especially if you go to the Quick Shots menu, because the very first time you go into the Quick Shots menu, it'll bring that back down to 1080p. So make sure you pop it up to 4K, it'll stay there for all future shots. Now in terms of just shooting regular video, you can tap the record button to get on going, but you'll also see next to that the ability to rotate the gimbal. Uh, let's go ahead and put it into vertical shooting mode from horizontal shooting mode. Below that is the ability to zoom in. This is a digital crop, so it's basically just taking that 4K frame and then cropping it into what is effectively a 1080p image. Still, it works pretty good in some cases. Uh, you can see right here where I've got a, a full wide shot, 
and then I crop in. And in the case of YouTube, if you're watching this on your phone in 1080p, you probably don't notice the resolution or the quality difference at all. It still records the file as 4K, but ultimately it is a bit of a cropped in image. I find it handy though from time to time, I just wanna do something very quickly and not have to deal with it in post-production. Next, if we switch over to photo modes, you can see I can take photos there. Again, just like before with choosing the 4K resolution, you do wanna make sure that if you want those raw images after the fact, that down on the bottom there, uh, you choose a format and choose JPEG plus raw. Otherwise, you'll just get the JPEGs, which is fine. But again, if you went out and shot some amazing shots and then got back and were like, oh, I wish I had the raw images so I could tweak them a bit better in uh, photo apps, well, at least make sure you do that before you get going. Speaking of tweaking, down at the very bottom there, there's the option to go ahead where it says auto, change that to pro. And this is true of both the video and the photo side. It allows you to tweak things like the white balance, the shutter speed, the ISO, the f-stop, et cetera, um, all are offered right there. The core difference between the Mini 3 and the Mini 3 Pro from a photo standpoint is the lack of the 48 megapixel photo. This tops out at 12 megapixel. Still, I'm getting great photos from it. You can see some of these shots right here on the screen. These are all just straight out of the drone photos, no tweaking, nothing else, all in auto mode, by the way. Uh, and so again, seeing some pretty good results there. Now, there is one area, however, that I do notice a quality difference between the Mini 3 and the Mini 3 Pro and that is on the controller itself. Uh, so the very first flight I went out, my wife and I were side by side with both drones, and I'm looking at the two controllers and I'm like, this just seems a little bit softer. The image on this seems softer. And the reason is, is that the Mini 3 base has a DJI slightly older transmission technology. And within that, it tops out at 720p stream from the drone to the controller. It's still recording at 4K on the drone, but on the controller itself, you're only seeing the 720p stream from the drone as opposed to the 1080p stream on the Mini 3 Pro. In reality, on the SD cards, it's just a sharp side by side. Again, look at these two images side by side between the drones. Uh, and you can see they're virtually identical as best I can get them. And I don't think like that should be a singular reason why you go for the Mini 3, the Mini 3 Pro. It's just like one interesting little difference I notice when you are having them side by side to go, oh, it looks just a little bit softer on this particular controller view. Which then gets to just general transmission range. Uh, in my case, because I live in Europe and all my testing this time around is in Europe, I'm already limited on range. I'll put the official specs on the screen right now. But in reality, you're kind of nowhere near that. Uh, in my testing, I had the DJI RC with the Mini 3 base, and I was like 1,000 meters, give or take, before I started seeing some signal degradation issues. This is over water uh, with nothing in between me uh, on a relatively clear day. I personally don't have much of a reason to fly drones beyond that range uh, from like a legal standpoint or anything else. Uh, but if you do, that may be something to consider. Most people have had better results with this controller uh, versus this one for range reasons. But again, my testing is under EU or CE rules, uh, which reduces the power from a transmission standpoint. If you were in the US or other countries uh, that follow basically the US side of the rules, then you get longer transmission. Note, this is automatically switched in the controller and the drone itself based on the GPS location you're at, at that point in time. There are no separate versions of the drone from like a US versus Europe. It's all the same drone, all the same hardware. You're just simply unlocked based on the GPS location at that exact point in time. Meaning if I take this drone and fly across the ocean to America, then in that case, I get the full range as any other drone in the US. And then finally, what about battery life and performance? Well, it's gonna like snow today and it's been really cold all week, which is the worst possible scenario for testing battery life. All of DJI's battery life claims are done indoors uh, in a lab environment at room temperature in a wind tunnel uh, where they're basically flying forward at a certain you know, speed uh, because it's actually more efficient to fly forward than it is to hover. Uh, so I don't have a good way to test that. Uh, I would say obviously it's winter right now and I would mostly in windy conditions. So my battery life is a lot less. If I look though where the Mini 3 Pro battery life has been for the last nine months or so of me using it, I'd say you're looking about 80% of their total claimed range. So for example, if I have the Plus battery, which claims at like 45 or so minutes on the Mini 3 Pro, I get like 35 to 38 minutes, give or take, on a flight. Okay, so where do I stand overall with the Mini 3? Well, for the price for the drone itself, it's a solid deal. It's got a bunch of amazing features in it, and it really ups the game, especially in the battery life realm. I have no like real complaints about this drone. It's pretty good. The one thing when it comes to recommendations though is that I would largely recommend that you just spend the extra money now for the Mini 3 Pro, the extra 220 bucks, if you can make that work. Uh, and the reason, as I mentioned earlier on, is the obstacle avoidance sensors in particular will probably save you that money longer term from a, like crashing into things if you're brand new to drones. If, however, you've already got something like the Mavic 3 and other drones, and you just want a sub 250 gram drone for like 
kind of to fit into your overall portfolio of drones in your house, then in that case, this probably makes a bit of sense if you have that flying experience and can avoid, you know, slamming into the side of your house on your first drone flight. And then when it comes to the controller side of it, uh, I have absolutely loved the DJI RC over the last nine months with the Mini 3 Pro. Uh, I use it as my daily everything. Uh, for example, this past summer, I went on an eight day hike with it, 180 kilometers, and I just took basically these two things, that's it. And the reason why is that everything is then self-contained. I don't depend on anything on my phone. I just know it all works as a single package here. The batteries are there. I don't have to deal with anything else. It's just like an easy button for me. Anyways, hopefully you found the inching are helpful. Uh, check out all my other DJI Mini 3 videos on the screen right here. Uh, I should soon have a full beginner's guide as well as a complete comparison between these two drones side by side, including all those nuanced differences. Uh, there's, there's a lot of them that are in there. With that, have a good one.